be wonderful if you were an airman. We could live at the aerodrome. Oh, Roy. Would you marry me then? Like a shot. Oh, yes, yes. I was 21 and more than friendly with Bess, the publican's daughter. I love you always. Will you, Roy? Above our village had been placed the aerodrome, a mysterious, opulent and threatening place which we villagers were informed was vital to the defences of our country. time to think. <laughs> you certain? Never more so. <laughs> Much better now. Happy. <laughs> Cheerio. Okay, right. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I hadn't meant to celebrate by getting quite so drunk. Nor had I expected the dinner party at the rectory to end as it did. Our guests were the squire and his sister, and a recent acquaintance of mine, Mark a flight lieutenant from the aerodrome, who I rather admired. <coughs> Dear friends, before proposing Roy's health, I shall first, with your permission, make some observations at this celebration of our young friend's coming of age. Yeah, yeah. I do this in fulfilment of a resolution I have made with myself to give you, who are all close friends, some news, which, although it may surprise, need not, I trust, distress. 21 years ago today, a little stranger, a baby, came to this house. We gave him the name of Roy, and we have kept him with us ever since. This is indeed the very day when this tiny boy, now a fine young man, first came to us. But it is not, in fact, his birthday. It cannot be. The lady, whom he is called mother, and I, who have been proud to bear the name of father, are not, you see, his parents, however much we may love him as though we were. Nor can we say exactly when he was born. This is but monstrous. It makes no difference at all. Are these the manners of the aerodrome? Sit! Who am I, then? 
This small stranger, Roy, was found in a basket at the top of the village at about the place where the main road now is. At that time, the aerodrome and the dual carriageway were in the course of construction. A good woman, now the wife of our local publican, brought the baby to us, trusting to our charity. Of its parents, nothing was known. Immaterial anyway. This is quite important. Mary dear, thank you. Now, by a strange coincidence, a coinciding of events such as only Providence provides, my wife was returned that same evening from a six-month stay abroad whither she had been forced to go for the treatment of a serious ailment. We decided to bring up the child as our own. Roy, my dear fellow, I raise my glass to you. And though at truth's behest, I have had to inform you that we are not, in fact, your real parents. Trust me, my boy, that you can rely on us as if we were indeed what you have called us. To Roy. To Roy. To Roy. Long life, health and happiness. God guard you, lad. Although none of this, as we all know, is of the least importance, it is a fact, is it not, Rector, that for the last 21 years you've been telling lies. Have the goodness to drink your friend's health, sir. To Roy. Who am I? I was not who I thought I was, and the people and places I had found so familiar suddenly seemed changed. And when I had made my way back to the rectory, still more revelations were to come. <sighs> not going here again, my son. Each year I've told it. And you've listened patiently. Oh, patient one. Although my corruption is a river, and I am become a stitch. <sighs> when was the beginning of my treachery? When did I murder first? When? The shameful thought came to me on the man alone. We were playing croquet. I saw my friend's head laid close to my betrothed as he sought to show her the acute angle through the hoop. Thou newest at in his honest face, intellectual gifts, his courage and integrity. Small wonder he was preferred to me, gaining the offer of this living, this house, and she who is now my wife. Even though she had pledged her troth to me, you watched, as I did, their embrace. You great dove were in the moon, I at the corner of the veranda by the tobacco plants. You perceived the depths of my deceit, the nurtured hatred in my heart. You remember, as I do, that climbing holiday. You know the place, the peak, the far weather. Through the clouds, you saw me as I cut the rope. You saw Anthony fall. Four thousand feet. Dr. Faulkner, our great friend and mentor, recovered the body. And I wept as the coffin was lowered into the ground. It was only after I had received this living and married the lady who is now my wife that the veil and mist of my deliberate sin fell from me. And I began too late, oh, hope of Jacob, to repent. I'm sorry to disturb you, dear, but will you come to bed now? It's past one o'clock, Gerald. Is it? have the agricultural show tomorrow. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. I expect you got rather drunk, dear. You needn't believe your father. He isn't my father. And I did. Oh, well. Never mind. All's best, though we oft doubt. Sleep tight.
their rights. They've passed a law. What are we going to do, Florence? If it's the law, then we have to obey it. What? Get out! Let them march in. No, I'll burn the house down first, before they commandeer it. So tiresome. Edmund's indisposed again. I'm sorry to hear that. Is there anything we can do? If there were, my dear sister would have done it. My weak constitution always interferes with the pleasures of others. I hope it wasn't occasioned by the Air Force. We saw a car. I'm ready. Shall we go? Ah, well. Oh, bounder! 